the street. All right, here's Are You a Janitor or Cleaner with John Geekspeak, Stoffiger, hey, there you go. and Matthew Matrix Hoy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Matt Hoy, and this is John Stoffiger. Uh, basically, we have alphabets, stuff like that. We've been doing this for quite a while. Um, both Matt and I currently work at Acuvant. Uh, we've had made many positions outside of that. During the day job, we are senior consultants, and this talk kind of came out of a lot of what we find during our daily jobs in dealing with incident response and companies who are trying to respond. So who are we? Um, for those of you who are playing at home and watching this on YouTube and uh, Iron Geek site later, um, we are thought leaders providing thought leadership. So if you want to provide this to your boss, these are good words that get all this stuff. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put into where you can actually actualize it during your everyday life. Why are we here today? Uh, a little bit about this conference or this talk exactly. We've done eight cons over the last one and a half years. Uh, this deck started out with 50 slides written on the back of a napkin in uh, the Delta Sky Lounge as we were going out to different ways. We thought, hey, this would be an awesome idea to take to a con. And since we were the first in our group to actually ever do this, it started out very small. We had to go through the whole CFP process, figure out all the ways to do it. Today, the slide deck is almost around 100. Uh, feedback from the audience participation and from everybody we've talked to is what's made this thing grown and be such an awesome talk to really take back and think about how to do your incident response in an active way. Apparently, mall cop security is now a thing. Uh, this talk was brought to you by mall cop security. I really should be... Why are you saying brought to you by mall cop security? Uh, because they pay me to do that. <laughs> Matrix here has coined the term active defense. There are actually two net books now written on it. Uh, he should be really charging for this. Uh, vendors are taking this up and really addressing the issue. So let's talk about where we have failed. What have we done? What are these mindsets that are causing us to take the downward spiral in incident response? A lot of our time is took, taken up just merely dealing with the issue and not really dealing with the, what's causing the issue. We, have a, we spend a lot of time mopping up the mess, putting the sawdust over the throw up, but never do we really figure out what's causing the issue. We need to look at risk assessment. Um, Right now, acceptable risk is really a premature foothold. If you're sitting here saying that this risk for your organization is acceptable at some point, you're really opening the door for a future foothold. If you take away all the low-hanging fruit and all you have left is your very low and medium vulnerabilities, what do you think your attacker is going to focus on? Just take this for a minute. Albert Einstein was, was quoted as saying that you can't really solve a problem with the same intelligence that created it. Well. The problems we have in industry, we try to solve with the same intelligence that's, that's created. We go back to the business and we try to have them fix their own problems, yet they were the ones who built in the first place. We can't be assuring or mitigating a risk with the same intelligence that's created it. It's not a matter of forest and trees. So one of the things that uh, I want to go ahead and bring up is I've been sent to many places where there actually is a actual spun up for incident response. They sit there and say, this isn't an is incident. I go, well, why am I here? Well, it's an issue. It's an incident. Well, no, it's an issue, or the problem doesn't actually exist. I don't want to get into semantics with the end user. The person who actually hired me was trying to go ahead and bring me in, parachute me in to go ahead and solve an issue. A problem. They've been breached. They've been owned. It's funny how they'll go ahead and argue the semantics with me in regard to what is the current state of the state. So how do we move forward? How, how do we get our house in order to take these problems we have with incident response, this whole mulling over, the sweeping under the rug, it never happened, it never existed, 
How do we take charge and take this to the next level? Grace Hopper once said that the, the dangerous phrase that we have is that we've always done it this way. That's something we come back to all the time. All the stuff we know about incident response is all about what we've always done. We've always done the same methods, the same techniques. The covering it up, rebuild the box, put it back into production. We don't really spend enough time going over why exactly were we breached and what can we do to fix it. So let's talk about janitors. Janitors are okay, just sit there and clean up the throw up on the floor. They'll throw the sawdust over it, they'll mop it up, and they'll move on to their next task. It's one of those things that's part of their job. Then we move on to the cleaner. We go beyond reimaging the box, moving to DR, and all kinds of other things that uh, are actually known to go ahead and, oh, we solved the problem, but we really didn't. So which one are you guys? Which one are we going to be? Do we want to be the janitor who just will clean up the mess? Or do we want to be the cleaner who gets rid of our attacker? So you go ahead and take a look at uh, the typical incident response life cycle. As per the SANS GCIH, you have pickerel, the preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovering lessons learned. This doesn't work. And John? When we get into incident response, we have to look at what's up here. And show of hands, anyone in the crowd that can tell me what this is? Nobody? All right, so we got some. Yes. We all have a t-shirt. Yeah, we, we do. If we had any, but we gave our last one to that man over there. <laughs> it's the, the cyber kill chain was developed as, as a way to understand how our attackers think and operate. And the idea is that the higher up on the scale that we can catch them, the less likely they are to make off with all of our goodies that they want. The issue we have now is that with our attack lifecycle and with the, the cyber kill chain, we're not really doing what we need to do because we let business interfere. Because the business demands more of our security, or I should say more, less of our security than the actual people doing it, we run into an issue with prioritization of where we're going to put our resources. If the business demands that we back off and not prepare the way we should, then business wins and we have to go on with our day. We're not executing the security development life cycle. So let's talk a little bit about preparation. What is not working today? We don't really understand our enemy. We don't understand the nature of the attacks that are happening. We have perfected Molokov security. We are only here to observe and report. We are very inadequately staffed. We, we like to hire people and give them every job under the sun and then security. We let the business drive a lot of our decisions. We, we let the, the different groups like marketing decide when are we going to put a system up, when an application is going to go into production. Whether or not it's secure, we need to get into production because we need the customer served. We need to make some money. And we don't actually know how to respond to an incident. So the attackers we have today have amassed an organization that mimics most of our organizations. They have all the different types of organization groups inside that, that we have. They have a marketing department that is out there getting their name out there, soliciting customers to buy their services. They have an operations group that maintains the wheels and cogs of the organization that get out there and do this. They have a development crew that makes sure that any time one of their pieces of, of weaponry gets detected, they can re-roll it and make some change and get it back out there so it can be effective. They have an accounting department that keeps track of paying all their employees. And finally, an HR department that's out there to screen employees and vet new people and get them in and rotate through. They are streamlined and efficient. Their development takes days, maybe hours, not weeks. They can re-roll their application set in a matter of hours and days when we can't even do it in a matter of months. An example with Zeus. Zeus even faced a, a source code leak where the actual source code for the application was leaked out to the community and they came up with four or five different versions that added functionality to the Trojan. What An event that would have been catastrophic to most of our you know, commercial software actually spawned more interest in their Trojan and got it out there more prevalent in the society. Most attackers these days are, are driven by a cause that's greater than your firewall, it's greater than your motivation to go to work today. They are motivated by cold hard cash or some other means of, of payment that's instant and direct, that instant gratification, that dopamine drop from being able to execute and get paid right away. I can tell you right now that that motivation is greater than your motivation to go into work each day. 
They don't have to deal with politics. They don't have to deal with all these other people. They get, they do their shit. They turn in their work and they get paid. When we sit here enumerating all the bad in the world, we're just creating a game for them. If you close off all the the high, you know, low hanging fruit and all the highs and mediums and only leave the, the lows, they're going to laser focus on that and dive right into it. Because why? They get an, an awesome instant gratification for doing it. They are far more motivated to forget you than you are at protecting yourself. The honey badger doesn't give a shit. The saying is, blue team, do everything right, you're still wrong. When you're wrong, it doesn't pay off. We, we love that in our first talk we gave about a year and a half ago, we came up with this presence, this, this premise, and we liked that Red Team blog actually retweeted us one day. The bad guys, they don't give a shit about your security process. They don't do change control. They don't need anybody's permission to own you. Your incident response shouldn't carry those same that same baggage. You cannot be effective at tackling incident response if you have to go through all these things, all these political endeavors to fix your shit. So let's talk about how we respond to stuff today. We like to enumerate all that's bad. Think about it. Antivirus is a great example of enumerating all that's bad. Uh, any, anything that has the word signature in it is enumerating all that's bad. Is it easier today to count what's bad in the world or what's good? In your own organizations, is it easier to count up all the stuff that is valid on your network in, in a business acceptable use case, or is it easier to count all the bad in the world? But we still do it. We have many applications, many ways out there to enumerate what's good, but we don't choose to do it because it's hard. It's hard to sit there and think about what well, the small number of things that our business accepts as valid on our networks, it's easier just to load up a signature set of all that's bad, but we miss it every day. It sucks. It leads to a race condition with your attacker that leads them to get more focused and, and more streamlined into what they need. It'd be far easier to enumerate all that's good. Then we get to talking about monitor mode and mall cop security. How many people here have IDSs? Or show of hands. IPSs? Great. How many of them are in monitor mode? Come on. I know it's more. We've seen more. We've seen more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How many of you have WAPs and that are also in, in a learning mode or an alert mode, not actually doing what they're, they're prescribed to do? We have perfected this idea that we're just going to observe what's going on and then hopefully take some action later. Does that work? It's a DVR. Remember, <laughs> pictures, they're not just memories. Their evidence. Do you want to be the guy with 40,000 alerts that we reported on and nobody took action on? There was a, a large retailer who just went through the same issue with their breach. They had 17,000 alerts per day that came through their systems. None of them that they actually took action on. We entrust that we're going to do the right thing. We set up these systems so that we're going to react right when it happens and, and swiftly come in and take charge and take action. But what really happens? We see the email and now we got to go talk to someone because no one wants us to actually do anything about it because it might hurt the customer, right? We don't want to lose business. Unfortunately, this creates a situation where the attacker has the upper hand. They can do anything they want and you're bound by your politics, by your internal processes that you can't take any action. And this is what gives them their whole advantage over you. They've got to jump on you at least three or four days from the time you detect what they're doing. Another issue that we've come up with is organizations tend to spend more on their catering and their commissaries than they actually do in their security department. I, I was at a, a company once that spent more on their fried chicken every day for lunch than they did in their security department. Yet, you know, security was a priority. A priority in business is something they spend money on. If they tell you it's a priority, but they're not spending money on your department, then you're probably not a priority. In this case, fried chicken was a priority for them. We really don't know how to hire in security. Um, I, I have seen many job applications and, and job racks out for security people where they list everything from changing the printer toner down to washing the CEO's car, and then security is somewhere buried in the middle. Understand that security is a full-time job. It is one person's job. It is a team of person's job. They can't be changing a printer toner at the same time that they're doing incident response. It doesn't work. One guy also cannot do incident response because while he's doing the incident response, who's watching the, the, the hen house? 
We love to let numbers drive. I, I hear this one all the time in, in my day day job. Um, we, we come up with the 80-20 rule. People want me to just take care of the top 20% of their vulnerabilities. Just get rid of the highs. You know, they, they think it's it's a math game that, you know, your adversaries aren't going to go after those low-hanging fruit because they're only worried about the top 20%. Understand that the people who want to attack you, once you take away all this surface, they're going to go for those lows and and the mediums because that's what they do that's what they're driven to do they want your data more than you want to protect it being 80 percent secure just means you're zero you're percent secure take a look at this word problem if we assume that 20 percent of the organization's vulnerability account for 80 percent of the incidents then we only want to tackle those 20 percent and get them eradicated are we going to eradicate 80 percent of our incidents is that what management tells us so where was Heartbleed on that 20% um, or the other 27 vulnerabilities to openness to sell that have come out since then? Uh, Shellshock, was that in there at all? Was that in your 20% of top vulnerabilities? Or that one K9-based uh, SSL vulnerability uh, of a version of SSL that has been deprecated for 13 years? You see, these things don't pop up in those 20% of vulnerabilities because they're side cases, but they're still vulnerabilities. They still are high. Playing the 80-20 rule only appeases management. It doesn't actually make you safer. So being 80% secure still makes you 0% secure. All you've done is narrowed your attack surface. Well, let's talk about feelings. We let feelings drive a lot in this industry. We don't want to upset people. I hear this a lot. I can't tell that guy his application is broken because it's going to make him sad. I can't deal, we can't be dealing with feelings. Your, your, your attacker, he doesn't care about your feelings. He doesn't care about making you sad. As incident responders, we shouldn't care about making people sad. Having a cute logo or a cute name for a vulnerability doesn't make it more special than the rest. We, we seem to have been focused a lot on that in the last few months, that every vulnerability now has to have a cute logo and a name. Having an emotional response to any of this shouldn't be part of our incident response plan. We shouldn't really be focus too much on how these people are going to feel rather than not we should be focused on how the business feels because I know not having a job and having my business go out of business makes me sad and I have to put that as a priority in making somebody else's sad. So we're going to go into a little compliance math for QSAs. Any, anybody know about compliance and how it equates to security? Yeah, They don't equal each other. Compliance really just equals complacency. It's always a weird question. A lot of people ask me, you used to do pen tests and vulnerability assessments. Why don't you do it anymore? Because all I have to do is change the date if I'm going to the same engagement. The same damn vulnerabilities exist every damn time. You're not fixing the boring banner grabs that I'm doing, which shouldn't even count for anything, but that's an easy fix. So why are we even bothering to go ahead and go through the exercise and take the effort to go ahead and do the QSA? Leading on to that, we tend to let the product drive in, in most places. Uh, the, these are actual posters that uh, a company out there is selling to startups. Um, these are supposed to be motivational posters for startups uh, on how they, they're supposed to attack stuff. My favorite one is the uh, fuck it, ship it. This attitude is so prevalent in companies today. It's like we, we may have an issue with this application, but man, we've got to get it out to market. You know, marketing has scheduled a release party. We're, we're going to have, you know, the crystal method show up. We've got to get that party going. So just ship the, 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 the app. We'll deal about security later. Uh, the other one you can't really see here is done is better than perfect because that's an awesome software strategy, right? And then that mall cop security. Yes. Anyway, I said it. <laughs> you did. Uh, we're going to have to get them to pay us 10 bucks. Politics driving is always interesting. I, I had one the other day where I was sitting with a security advisor for a large bank, and he said, I, and, and I quote, I, I don't really care about security. I just want to make my QSA happy. I, I hear this a lot, and it's kind of sad. We're, we're, we're issuing actual good work for complying with a compliance framework that would be already okay if we were just doing what we should be doing. The other one I love on here is the uh, our, our team doesn't do preventative security. We only do stuff after the breach. This is 
the, the, the guys who mop up. You know, they, they don't care about preventing it. They'll just worry about when it happens, they'll go and do something. Or the last one, I only open up tickets I know I can close. That's a scary one. That is a person who's driven by ticket metrics in a security organization, and we all know how long these things can take. So judging people by the number of tickets they open and close isn't really an effective strategy for managing security. So let's talk about how we respond. This is a typical incident response cycle for most companies. <laughs> <laughs> Winner! She yeah. gets a t-shirt too. Yes. Come see us after. See, they're even clapping for me. <laughs> if this mirrors your incident response strategy, we, we need to talk because really it shouldn't be this, but this is what's happening. The other incident response that we, we found is, is this. We, companies tend to use Brian Krebs as their incident as their intrusion detection system. You know, when you get the call from Krebs, you, you know you've been hacked. So let's talk about J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan waited a month to tell people that they had been breached because they wanted to make sure that they, you know, weren't being giving out the wrong information to people. This is a bank that got breached with over 74 million accounts, and they waited 30 days to notify their customers that they had been breached. Anybody know what happens after 30 days? You can no longer claim any damage from that attack. So they literally waited until that statute of limitations left before they let people know stuff had happened. P.F. Chang's, anyone ever shop there or eat there? Oh, they had an interesting one. Their POS systems were, were attacked and, and malware installed. So they decided, hey, we're going to stop using our POS systems and go back to knuckle draggers. Uh, anybody here familiar with the old knuckle drag system of credit cards? What do they produce? Carbons, great. So a company that has malware on the POS system, do you think they, they are smart enough to know that you don't throw that in the trash? No. They just made this attack so much easier. So now I don't have to worry about the malware on their POS. I just hang out outside and go through their trash can. I now have more credit card numbers than I ever had in the past. All these companies, they, they all deserve special recognition. Yes, they, they're on my shirt as well. All these companies have had a breach, a, a large significant breach in the last year and a half, and none of them know where it came from or how it happened. So let's talk about change. 2014, there was a, a study done on SQL injection and found that 65% of the companies in the U.S. had suffered a SQL injection attack. It took 140 days to detect, 68 days to remediate. So let's do some math. 208 days it's set vulnerable. That means for 208 days, two-thirds of a year we spent with all that information sitting out there for anyone to pilfer. Why is this failing? Why are we failing to, to do these things? Because we're not attaching monetary value to what's going on. We're not being able to make that business case to our, our leadership that says there is actually a dollar figure associated to what happens when we get breached. We need to monetize everything that happens within our environment. We need to go through the cost of a solution versus the cost of an adverse event versus the cost of doing nothing because there is always a cost to doing nothing. Once we follow the money, Symantec and the Ponemon Institute created an awesome website, uh, the Data Breach Calculator, that actually give you all the information you need to prepare the, the email to your boss, explaining to him the cost of what's going on. This is an enormous tool when you're fighting for funding for your department, when you're fighting for training, when you're fighting for staff. It breaks down everything that's happening to a language that our business peers accept and can understand. Let's stop enumerating everything that's bad in the world. Let's go to a zero trust model. The zero trust model was pulled out of Forrester Research, and the idea behind it is pretty simple. Let's just stop trust and verify and go to a verify and don't trust. Everything should be verified. Nothing should be trusted. It works. It, it stops enumerating all the bad stuff in our environment and starts getting into an, an environment where we verify everything that comes into us and everything that's leaving. Well, what if I block legitimate? Darn. <laughs> the cost of blocking legitimate traffic is very small compared to the cost of a breach. The cost of accidentally blocking a supposed customer is very minimal compared to what all these companies have paid in their associated breaches. 
We need to understand our customers are not stupid. I've read very many breach notifications and all of them come up with this idea that customers don't know what's going on and they, they come in with the assumption that I'm just going to trust everything that they say. A, a company that's just been breached telling me that they are, are sure that my information has not been used for nefarious purposes, like I'm really going to believe that. We need to be honest and stop with the double speak and just come out and say, it, hey, we were pwned, we fixed it, it's good, but hey, your, your shit may have been used for bad stuff. Here's your credit monitoring. Here's the steps to do it. By lying and using the double speak and using this flowery language like they care about security because obviously they, they didn't care enough. We need to put everything in scope. I've been through a lot of engagements where the customer has these very, very you know, curtailed down scoping, engage, scoping operations where they don't want to see stuff outside of this small range. Because, you know, your attacker is going to follow that same scoping guideline. He, he's going to go and say, hey, you know, I can't touch that machine because I know it's important to you. And if it goes down during the day, you're going to be screwed. So I'm just going to back off. No, attackers don't do that. They don't care. So when you go through your security assessments and you put out these scoping guidelines where you say, hey, you can't you know, touch these machines, realizing that that's still a target, that doesn't mean it's not out of scope. That doesn't mean it's not a fair play. You've just really shortened your, your test down and really taken any good you're going to get out of it and left it. If you get rid of everything that's high and medium in your environment, now all your lows become your new highs. If that's all there is to take out, you've got to be warned that that's what your attacker is going to focus on. If all you have is, is your lows and mediums exposed to the outside world, that's their foothold, that's what they're going to crank open, and that's where they're going to start attacking. By taking away the stuff, you've now in shortened your attack surface and made your attacker laser focused on where your weak points are. So now we've got to start fixing stuff. Too many times I've run into situations where we've produced a report, we've gone back to them, and they've said, oh, that's great. A year later, we come back and we're issuing the same report because no one's fixing anything. Remediation today is not optional. Lessons learned are not optional things to do. We need to start remediating as soon as we find the vulnerabilities. Stop with the political games of it's not my issue, it's his issue, or it's that issue over there. Get it done, get it fixed so we're not vulnerable in the next year. Let's see some stuff drop off that VA. <laughs> Charles Venner of, of WebSense came up with this, uh, through their report, they came up with this finding that these attackers aren't using these highly crafted, very expensive zero days that they're, they're finding and making. They're actually using whatever's the cheapest off the shelf they could find, and then they're weaponizing it using against you. And then when that fails, they go find the next cheapest thing to use against you. It's not like they're running a high stakes game of professionally developed, you know, O days that, you know, come from China and Russia. They're, they're finding stuff that's cheapest for them that has the highest margin and the highest return. My question to that is, how is this succeeding? If we're getting pwned by stuff that you know can be bought cheaply off the, the web or, or wherever, why are we not doing our jobs? Attacks are able to succeed because we don't really know where it came from, we don't know what it does, and we don't know who's behind it. Our generic approaches that we've taken to incident response, the one size fits all to everything, is not working. Every attack should warrant an immediate response. And we switch. Thank you, John. So, when we go ahead and look at the pickerel cycle, one thing that we actually don't prepare for in the preparation phase is the enemy has no rules. They don't need change management to go ahead and probe your systems. They don't need any of that stuff. Uh, they don't need check boxes. Basically, they don't have rules. Where we're failing, when we go ahead and get into the identification phase, a lot of us have gone ahead and relied on putting together signatures, seams, and other things. We set it, we forget it, and we often forget it. So therefore, when 40,000 alerts come in, oh, that's just the thing that, uh, oh yeah, I'll silence those because we really didn't need those. It's bad that when we're identifying incidents, it's usually Krebs is your IDS, Pastebin, or the authorities come and tell you, we found your credentials, 
and you need to take a look at this. Or all of our customers' data is dumped on the face bin on Reddit. Something like that, or even worse. So what we fail to go ahead and do when we identify things, people have to go ahead and make sure that you identify an attacker. And when you're identifying who's actively attacking you, we failed to go ahead and try and find out the who, what, when, where, and why. If we don't know who's actually attacking us, we can't actually respond with the correct response. We're going to go ahead and pull the server from the internet. We're going to go ahead and respond with the wrong response. It is important that we go ahead and do identification to result in immediate action. We need to go ahead and create dossiers. We need to attack, we need to basically get inside of the mind of our attacker, figure out the attacker's skill level. Was this a direct or indirect attack? And basically, the very same thing that they do to us from the very start in the cyber kill chain, start doing the same reconnaissance that they did to us. Generally, when we're attacked, we have one or two pieces that we can go ahead and identify. Normally, it's a piece in a log. We see that, oh, this particular IP hit me. Most people don't go ahead and actually look at the IPs associated and start following the breadcrumbs, because if there's one, there's more. We often overlook your actual in-house physical assets. The thing of it is, is any advanced attacker is going to go ahead and pivot, but where did it go? We don't catch the actual data value when we finally see the data leaving the door. Nobody's done any classification. Nobody's gone ahead and actually found out where network connectivity is. It's been many, many times that I've gone to a place and I've sat there and said, well, they pivoted from here. That's impossible because we have defense in depth. No, your network's flat. No, we have defense in depth. No, I, the guy pivoted from here and he went there. And nothing stopped him. No ACLs know anything else. And if you're only using an ACL, I really wouldn't call that defense in depth. We often overlook what the actual target value is as to when people are attacking us. Uh, over the course of history, we've seen targeted attacks in which crafted PDFs, crafted Excel spreadsheets have come in. We never ever bother to ask, where did this start? Whose machine did this originate from? And what access did the person originally have? Yes, it's APT again. I like the whole thing in Invader Zim. No, it's not stupid. It's advanced. Uh -oh. Slide intentionally left blank. Yes. So, what we often overlook is when they actually go ahead and get in, uh, we don't actually go ahead and know which devices on this so-called defense in depth network we can go ahead and find to identify the attacker. We often overlook the very, very simple things in which we don't talk to our own people. If we could go ahead and find something that's actually originated, from within a successful spear phishing campaign, we would do much better. In security, too many times we don't actually have dialogue with our people. We often overlook dialogue. When a particular place lost its keys, nobody bothered to ask the end user simple questions. Did you see any weird email? Did anybody pick up a strange USB in the parking lot? 
bad USB is out there, it's going to be a very bad attack vector. So, feel free to go ahead and not just be security that penalizes end users for doing things that we would call stupid, but encourage dialogue within your particular end users, because I guarantee you, if you're just doing your security training, what's going to happen is somebody's going to go ahead and play the video, like I often do, and come back later and answer the questions. Uh, it kind of makes that. sense, too, that if you want to help out your end users, something as simple as taking them to lunch, acknowledging them as people, opens up that dialogue and opens up them to feel comfortable coming to you with their issues. A lot of people we've seen, their end users just don't feel comfortable coming to their security groups with anything because they, they have this fear that they're going to get somehow punished for showing them that they got something or maybe they accidentally clicked on something. And one of the ways that we've gone ahead and traditionally done this is I had to go ahead and go to even higher management. Nobody bothers to look at physical security. Let's go ahead and buy these folks a Starbucks latte if we actually see people stopping tailgating. That actually encourages people to go ahead and talk to us. Something that is real simple. It's a simple cup of coffee. And when I do actually go ahead and try and ask them, I see this signature came from your computer. What happened? Uh, can we go ahead and talk about it? They usually go ahead and talk about it. So, tools that I use to go ahead and gather information on my particular attacker, when I finally get logs, when I finally go ahead and see things, I start at Robtex. You would want to go ahead and do the same interrogation that they do to go ahead and create a dossier on us. You have the upper advantage as far as you know your environment. You should be able to see what your attacker is doing, where they're coming in. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to sit there with your hands, sitting on top of your hands, and not doing anything. At times, you may want to go ahead and actually go ahead and tell that to the attacker and see if something comes up. If a simple telnet, end map, things like that show up, Sometimes you may see a sudden stop of your actual attacker because it's something that someone's behind the helm of the wheel and it's not automated. So definitely you want to go ahead and use plain pen and paper and write down all these IPs that are suspect and any responses that you see. Don't take your brand new iPhone 6 and start taking screenshots because that will become evidence. You need to go ahead and do things sometimes the old way. In building a dossier, this is a simple Rob text in which I can go ahead and grab and see ASNs, see their CIDR block, see who they're connected to, because before I even go ahead and do such a thing as telnet or scanning, I had better know that these people are not that big I don't want to invoke the wrath of a DDoS coming at me, especially if I'm not adequately capable of going ahead and handling it. You mean you don't want to poke the bear? Yeah, I don't want to go ahead and poke something that I can't win. So, containment. I've seen this in a lot of organizations in which, yeah, we just go ahead and unplug the machine. And we'll wait for the uh, forensics guys to go ahead and figure out what's happened. Not a good idea. If you're already, if they're already in there, they're already in there. It depends on what your company's stance is, and you should have already done the preparation to have these conversations with your executives as to how long can I leave this box up? Can I go ahead and actually have another way of actually? switching the VLAN into something else to honeypot them. You have to go ahead and prepare to do these things. As far as containment, what is not working, you definitely don't want to go ahead and switch to your DR. I've seen people go ahead and do this and say, well, our production is completely hosed. Let's go ahead and switch to DR. 
Can we get a show of hands in the crowd? If your production site just got hosed and you switch to DR, what do you think is going to happen? How, How many patches behind are you on that? It's good to, to note that most of the time our DR sites are at least one or two revisions behind our production site. So if there's a vulnerability that exists in production, it good chance that it's going to exist in DR as well. And we've just given our attacker a whole fresh set of new boxes to pwn in the same way he just got done doing. So what we don't want to go ahead and do is immediately go ahead and re-image the box, throw it back into production. If I have the upper hand of being able to see what my attacker does, why not flush him out? In that dialogue that I have with other people, and the fact that security is not necessarily someone who's going to go ahead and punish you, but I want to go ahead and be an enabler. If I'm lucky, I can go ahead and have that dialogue with the actual end users. If I find a phishing email and it gets turned into me because I've gained their trust, I own the application logs. If I own the application logs, what can I do? I can do a lot of things because I can go ahead and start feeding them fake usernames that are identifiable only to me. I take these 50 pieces, I manually feed them in and see what the responses are. I also take another 300 and I'll go ahead and automatically feed my fisher and see what the response time is. There's nothing that says you can't provide an attacker with fake data. And there's nothing that says you have to be absolutely true when you're responding to their phishing email. And it's a great tool to be able to feed them canaries that you know the answer to and then watch your logs to have them come back and try to breach your systems with those accounts. Half the time they they think that oh, the account's just been termed and they move on. But it gives them to give up their side of the world and, and give up their cover as they're trying to breach you. And more importantly, what I need to know is, is there someone behind the wheel? Is this automated? Is a bot just throwing this all back to me and trying to log in? Oftentimes it'll tip its hand because if I throw out 300 in the script and 300 come back immediately within a 15 second time frame, they're automated. If I have somebody slow playing me and actually taking their time and my logs start showing up and my filters go, yeah, somebody's probably either got Zeus or their man in the middle or something else. I need to know these things because I can't assess what my attacker is doing. It's important when you want to do this, though, that you tune all your s systems to key off those canaries that you just fed to your attacker. From here on out, you're going to be playing a game with them where you need them to expose themselves and you need to know who it is that is actually doing this attack. And the way you do this is by feeding them information that you want them to have and directing them in places you want them to go. More importantly, I can go ahead and pick up where they left off. If I had initial IP addresses of their initial attack vector, that's good. They probably burnt those already. But by feeding them, I can go ahead and get more IP addresses. Then I go ahead and do some OSINT based on the IP addresses and possible emails that they may be redirecting accounts to. I'm probing my attacker. I make sure that I go ahead and scan them but only after I've gone ahead and created the dossier and made sure that I can handle that type of traffic. I would not try to go ahead and do this unless you've actually already sized up who's coming at you. By the way, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not your legal department. You better have support. Go back to preparation in this. Make sure that people understand what it is that you're going to go ahead and do because the fun part is getting into a strike back. Ooh. So, in cases in which I've had absolute preparation put together, you can go ahead and get direct with your attacker. Go ahead is to take his compromised assets, throw up on Windows Box net stats. I know you're doing this. Would you kindly please knock it off? I've gone as far as to go ahead and find out who's actually at the other end. And it's amazing when you can go ahead and directly email or give the guy a phone call. 
If I can't be direct with the actual attacker, sometimes I'll even go ahead and try and cripple him by going to his ISP and host. In one particular instance, I went to the host. Now, this particular hosting company had no business trying to go ahead and connecting to a financial institution a thousand times per every 30 minutes. That's not suspicious at all. No. So I go ahead and call the abuse department of the ISP. Actually, it's not even ISP. It's a hosting company. And I say, I want to go ahead and send you some sanitized logs. You have some people in your network who are doing some very bad things. And here's where the maybe not comes in. Oh, it's that IP. These guys pay me a lot of money to be in the hosting. They bought a whole cider block. Well, I just found out that they own the whole cider. I guess I kind of blacklisted them and dropped the whole thing. In other cases, we have incidents that have occurred in which intellectual property accidentally slipped out and basically a client was accused of leaking it and we were only given a website as to where the so-called intellectual property was leaked to. We combed the forums. We went ahead and figured out the originating IP. We were able to provide a portfolio in which we took Maltigo, Spokio, and an end result, we actually knew where our attacker was. If you're doing dossier right, I know where you live. You should. Uh, at the very least, I didn't take any direct action about that. That was all turned over to legal. We were able to go ahead and give geo IP location, email addresses, and other forum activity. I can't actually share the, the true thing, so I've kind of just sanitized things. In the fact that we have in the pickerel lessons learned, lessons learned don't usually include the intelligence gathering. We don't actually go ahead and try and understand the skill set of the attacker or their motivations. Other things that we can go ahead and do is if we can actually determine what the attacker is doing, if they're automated, why not use automated back against them? Robert Rowley at IMLA actually gave a good example of doing this in his talk on weaponizing your WAF. He could detect patterns in which certain bots were fighting back against his bots, so why not just leave a bot to go ahead and K-line these things? Uh, it's out there on the net. Teach your WAF new tricks. Basically, we need to go ahead and make sure that we're creating the dossiers and using open source intelligence in which our community has done a damn good job in creating sources for. And we need to go ahead and learn about attack methods and maybe we ought to share. In lessons learned, basically, I haven't seen that many people actually go ahead and bother to fill these things out. Uh, when I create the report in the lessons learned, I actually provide the dossier. I want to go ahead and know this attack. We want to know if they might come back. We might want to know what networks they were associated with. Most of the time, all they want is the PR statement and oh, we close the hole, this is a lesson learned, and that's not really going to fix anything. In threat intelligence, you really don't have to pay for it when you already have it within your own organization. You have the actual data that you need. If you actually bothered to establish the timeline, go back to the five W's and make sure that you understand the attacker. One of the props I want to go ahead and give out to is Vinny, because he actually said, hey, if you're actually doing this capture during the attack, which you should do, why not replay it? There are things that you might have missed 
while you are actually doing your initial analysis that you should go ahead and replay the tape provided you actually had the uh, capture traffic during your analysis. And that's pretty much our talk and questions. Comments? Excellent. Indifferences? Yay. Yes. Alrighty then. Peace. We out. <laughs> oh, and if anyone wants some, there's stickers up here. Please take them. Which are the t-shirts. Yes. So.